So I was thinking about uh, this moment and what I might share with all of you. And um, I read this really interesting book. It was by a guy named Oliver Curtis. And he would fly all over the country and take pictures of, uh, of iconic landmarks. But what he would do is this, it was a little twist on it. He'd show up to the landmark, the iconic, famous landmark, and then he'd turn his back and take a picture of whatever was there. And in the book, you don't see the landmark. You gotta kind of imagine it in your mind. And so, it's like, for, for instance, let me, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about. So right back here is the iconic landmark, and that's what you see looking from it. The iconic landmark is Stonehenge. So imagine, the guy flies all the way there, drives all the way to Stonehenge, gets there, there's Stonehenge, there's the landmark. That, that's what matters, and he takes his camera and goes like this, he takes that picture. I had to hunt down the picture of Stonehenge because he doesn't include it in, the, in his book. Really interesting, Here, here's, here's another one. They start getting a little bit easier. So that's the picture looking out from the landmark. Anybody know what it is? The White House, the White House. So he flies to Washington, D.C., there's the White House, there's the iconic landmark, and he turns and the guy's taking a nap. <laughs> out in front of the, the, the lawn. Here's another one, check this one out. You'll never guess what the iconic landmark is. Flew all the way there, and he turned his back on the pyramids. Isn't that crazy? How about, how about this one here? This one you'll never guess, but, but most of you have been there, you've seen it. Anyone know? The Hollywood sign. So he goes up, gets to the Hollywood sign, turns around and took a picture of whatever that is back there. <laughs> how, about, how about this one? Some of you will get this one. Come on. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, Christ the Redeemer, that's right. Now the picture, it's not a bad picture, but he leaves out the icon, he leaves out the landmark. How, how about this one? Some of you will get this one. Taj Mahal, that's the Taj Mahal. Flies all the way to India. Shows up at the, at the Taj Mahal. And takes that picture. It's crazy. How about this one? Come on. It's the Wailing Wall. There you go. Guy flies all the way to Israel. There's the icon, turns around, and there's a guy right there. How about this one? You guys will all get this one. Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty, right? I was thinking about this. These Iconic landmarks are pretty much mundane without the picture of the landmark. In other words, it's, it's the landmark that matters. And for some reason, this guy just went and took these crazy pictures of things that really, really, really don't matter. I, I decided I was gonna do do one. This one wasn't in the book, okay? But, but I did one. Here it is, put it up. So, so, so remember, the landmark is here. I've turned. And probably all of us have a tree. I've got one in my home and it's got lights and it's got all the bulbs on it. And, Probably a lot of us have, uh, I don't know, garland or something hanging on our, on our uh, you know, fireplaces. Maybe we have wreaths up on our home, put lights up on the house, send on our Hallmark cards. We've done all that kind of stuff. 
But the landmark, the iconic landmark is this. A little, little baby that was born in a pinhole on a map called Bethlehem. And I think somehow, in America especially, we, we, we've turned our back on what's important and we focused our cameras or our lives really on the mundane. And somehow we, we've, we've bit. And the trees and the presents and, and the wreaths and the poinsettias and, and, and all that is, is what we're focused on. We, we got a whole book dedicated to all of that. Not that there's anything, you know, inherently evil or wicked in a tree or poinsettias or a wreath. I, I got them up in my home. But as I was looking at that book, for whatever reason, I thought, you know, that, that's something I, I think in America we've done. For some, it's become about, you know, Santa and Frosty and just a lot of things that just gotten us away from the iconic landmark. So what I did was, I have 14 verses I'm gonna to read to you. And these best describe the landmark of this season, the landmark, if you will, of all the songs that we've been singing, especially this last one, Silent Night, Holy Night. And I don't know whether it was a silent night or not. I, I, I was at the birth of my three kids. And I'm, I can tell you it wasn't silent. There was all kinds of noise at doctor's hospital. So I don't know whether it was a silent night, but I do know this. It was a holy night. It was a night like no other night. It was a night that was set apart as holy as it was when my three kids were born, and those were holy nights, there's no doubt about it. As holy as it was when your children were born, and those are holy moments. Those are set aside moments. Those are sanctified moments. There is no moment like the iconic landmark of a baby being born in a manger. Let me, let, me, let me read this to you. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of, of Syria. This was in biblical days. Jesus hasn't been born yet, okay? He is going to take a census. And the reason why this census was gonna be taken was because the Roman government wanted to know who lived in each town so that they could collect a tax on all of the people. For whatever reason, for thousands of years, all the different governments that are out there, including ours, are really, really good at collecting taxes. And they were good at it 2,000 years ago. And it says, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So you need to follow this. Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth. But they were both born in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was like a pinhole on a map. When you got old enough, you, you got out of Bethlehem. There weren't a lot of jobs in Bethlehem. There weren't a lot of careers in Bethlehem. 
And so whenever you got old enough, you would get out of there and go somewhere else, go to a, a bigger city where, you, where the job opportunities would have been better. And so Mary and Joseph are both living in Nazareth, but this governor says, I've got to get a, a, a census. And so you had to go back to the town that you were born in. They didn't have computers. You couldn't just register online. And so because both Mary and Joseph were from the city of David or Bethlehem, they have to make the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Okay, you all understand the story? It goes on and says this. While they were there, while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The reason why there was no room in the motel or the hotel, there was no room in a bed and breakfast or an Airbnb, the reason why is, is because Everybody who was born in Bethlehem has had to come back to Bethlehem for a few days to register for the census. So the town is packed full of people. And by the time Mary and Joseph arrive, there's no room anywhere. It wasn't that they were poor. Joseph had a job. He was a carpenter. He had money. It's just that when he got there, every hotel was taken. There's no room. But fortunately, they found a barn, or probably it was more of a cave where animals were, were kept. And that's where this baby was born. It goes on and says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified, but the angel said to these shepherds, and he would say it to you tonight. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Amen. Include you. Today in the town of David. Today in the town of Bethlehem. The reason why they call it the town of David is because King David was born there. So it's also known as the town of David. But it's, the, it's Bethlehem. Today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. It's Christ the Lord. Beloved, that's the iconic landmark. Amen. That's what all this music has been, been about. And for whatever reason, I don't understand it all. Boy, we have really done this and we're now taking pictures of the mundane. The mundane has become really what's most in, important. Now as I was reading this story over and over again this week, I really wanted to talk to those of you that you know Christ. You understand the story. And for those of you that are here visiting with us and maybe, you know, obviously you're not hostile to the things of God, you're here, right? Um, I think this will be an interesting moment maybe for you to enter in. Because what I want to do is, is I want to talk about the landmark. I want to talk about the manger because that baby grows up. He dies when he's a little older than 33. He's going to go to a cross voluntarily, give up his life. They're going to put him in a tomb. And three days later, he's going to walk out of that tomb, you know, proving who he said he was, and that's God. We, we celebrate that at, in April, you know, that's Easter or March. But what I wanted to do was try to find one verse, one sentence that Jesus said when he was an adult that might capture the icon and what it's about. And I think I found it. Jesus had a group of people in front of him, just like you're in front of me right now. I think if Jesus were here right now, he, he might share this same thought with you. 
because it captures the landmark. He said this. He said, I have come. The reason why there's a manger scene, the reason why I was born in that little cave or that, or that barn, the reason why that all happens is so that you would have life. And not just any kind of life, but life to the full. Now here's what's interesting. The people that Jesus said that to were alive. So what's he talking about? What do you mean? You came that I might have life. I am alive. If you were standing right here saying that, that, that very you know, sentence to you, you would think, well, I am alive. I want to show you something. I think it'll help you. I have this rope here. And I want you to imagine that this rope is really your entire existence. Okay, it just goes on and on and on and on. Imagine this rope goes all the way to the moon and back a few times, I don't know. And this rope is your entire existence, okay? This little red piece here is the time that you will spend on planet Earth in comparison to all of eternity, your entire existence. So, so, so compared to all this, compared to eternity, that, that's, that, that, that's your life here on planet Earth. And statistically speaking, guys, you'll live to be about 76. Ladies, you outlive us. You'll live to about 81, statistically speaking. And I'm amazed at how many believers just spend so much time and energy and effort on this, without ever thinking about this, their eternity. I'm amazed at how hard we work. We'll work and work and work and work and work and we put money away so that maybe when we get to this little piece, we can retire. <laughs> and I have a roof over my head, you know, and I got food to eat and, and I can go play golf every now and then. Think about this, beloved, those of you who know Christ. You have this eternity and we just spend all this juice right here. When Jesus came and said, hey, I've come to give you life, he wasn't talking about this. I came to give you life eternal. I came to make sure that when you take your last breath here on planet Earth, when the little red part of your life is over, that 76 years or that 81 years, whatever it might be, that you would have life, eternal life, with me forever and ever and ever. Amen. And we as believers can get so focused on this that we forget about that. And we begin to make decisions and, and choices about this instead of decisions and choices that will impact our eternity. There was a man in the Bible, his name was Job. 
And he asks a, 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 a really, really great question. He said, if a man dies, will he live again? And what he's saying this is this. Let me translate that for you. He's saying, what happens when the red part's over? Well, well what's gonna happen? When a man dies, will he live again? And the answer is absolutely. Where that person will spend their eternity, that's another, that's another question. The wisest man that ever lived said this in Ecclesiastes chapter three. He said, there's a time for everything. In a season for every activity under the sun, there's a time to be born, there's a moment when the red part of your life started, and there will be a time when the red part of your life will end. Happens to all of us. One of my dearest friend's mother, her time is just about over. She's in hospice care. There is a season for everything. By the way, uh, uh, Solomon went on to say, death <coughs> is the destiny of every man. In other words, when you're born, you're, you're gonna get to the end of the red. It, it is the destiny of everybody. And so while you're alive, while you're in this little thing here, man, you gotta think about this. You ought to think about your eternity. It only makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, all of us are, are gonna take our last breath at some moment, and then we're gonna enter into eternity. And Jesus said, look, let me tell you why I came. I came. Not that this life somehow would be fantastic. Just because you know Christ as your savior doesn't mean that this part of your life is gonna be great. For those of us that name the name of Christ, sometimes this right here can really be a, a, a hard go, right? But Jesus says, hey look, it's okay. because I came to give you life, eternal. I'm interested in your eternity. Now one of the things that the angels said when they showed up on that Judean hillside and was talking to those shepherds, he said, hey, hey, don't be afraid. And I do think that this Christmas season, God has a word for all of us, even during this red little season, and that is don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. And one of the things that I know to be true about all of us, all human beings, is that we worry about things, right? I worry about my health, I, I worry about my kids, I, I worry about my wife, I, I worry about the church, I worry about a lot of things. You, you probably worry about your kids or your parents. You worry about your jobs or your careers. Hey, this past week, a lot of you are right here. You're about ready to retire, and the stock market just crumbled. And you're worried, aren't you? Oh, man. Hey, listen, we can worry about a lot of things, Christian. But God says, look, I don't want you to worry. You got nothing to be afraid of, nothing. Because I've got your eternity covered. Got it all covered, you don't have to worry about it. But the second thing that these angels said on that Judean hillside that holy night was this. Hey, I got some good news. And this world needs some good news. And not only is this good news, but I want you to know something. It's gonna bring you great joy. 
It's going to pump you up, man. It's going to get you excited about this piece of your life. How can that be? Because today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. Somebody who will secure your eternal future. That's good news. That'll make you, that'll make you happy. That makes me smile every time I think about it. That you know what? My eternity has all been squared up because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, here's another thing that Jesus said about himself. He said, for God so loved the world. And that word world right there doesn't mean the globe, it doesn't mean the planet. He created the globe, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about people. For God so loved people that he gave his one and only son. He sent his one and only son, the iconic landmark, the manger scene. He sent his son here that whoever would believe in him, whoever would put their trust in him while they're alive, whoever would relinquish their life to him, whoever would say, I'm gonna let you be the CEO of my life. I'm not gonna be it anymore. I'm gonna give my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Anybody who would do that, they shouldn't perish, but they would experience that life that Jesus came to give them, that eternal life. And one of the things that we've done here, at least the last few gatherings, is we've given people a chance to do two things. For believers, this might be a great moment for you to take that card, and I want you to put a star up in the corner if you would say, you know what, man, I have, I've been so worried about that that I'm not sure I've lived in a way that would honor the one who secured my eternity. Maybe you look back on, on you know, this past year and go, whoa, man, somehow I got away from the Lord. I don't, I don't know how all that works. I don't know. I just know it happens. And tonight could be a great night where you say, hey, look, I don't know how much of this I got left. I, I don't know. But I want to start living a life that honors and glorifies the Lord. I want to rededicate my life, so to speak. And if you'd put a star up in the corner, I'll get those tonight and I'll be able to rejoice with you and I'll personally pray for you. <clears throat> that tonight as you leave here, that this next year might be the greatest year of whatever time you got left. And I'll invite you to our, our follow class and maybe that'd be a, a, a great place for you to come and kind of re-engage the, the Christian life. But these cards right here are cards where some, I, I, and I don't know how it works, I, I, I just know that the Lord has probably spoke to some of you. And for the very first time, the, the, the landmark, the thing that really matters, has captured your heart. And it would be really crummy before Paul and the guys came out and sang this last song if I didn't give you a chance to respond and say, hey, you know what, I, I, I need the Lord. I need Jesus in my life. He came to give me life and I don't even know him. My eternal future has not been secured. And you could leave here tonight knowing that Whenever you take your last breath, I don't know when it's gonna be, I don't know when mine's gonna be, that you would spend, you'd know for a fact, you would spend your eternity with him forever in glory. That'd be a good thing to do. And so right now, why don't you just, I don't know, close your eyes for just a moment. And if you're here, and I don't know how it works, I really don't know how it works. All I know is God loves you deeply and you're here. And I know that some of you walked in here, you're watching online or you're watching over in the venue or out in the cafe 
and, and God's doing something, and right now you know that you need to surrender your life to him. You, you need to receive this life that he came to give us. Know that your sins are forgiven and that you would spend your eternity with him forever. That'd be a good thing to do. I don't know why anybody would turn that down. So if you're here, just, just pray this, just quietly in your heart. Just I'm gonna make it up, it's not found in the Bible, but you gotta mean it. Just say, dear Jesus, I get it. I get the landmark for the first time. I get what this season's really all about. You came to secure my eternity. And I surrender my life to you right now. I give you my life. I want you to be the CEO of my life. Come into my life right now, Jesus. I want the life that you came to give. Now while your heads are bowed for just a moment, j just so I can rejoice, and it's kind of hard for me to see, man, I I'd love to know if, if, you, if you prayed that. Just like the people in these cards last hour. Just, just, just raise your hand, M make sure I see it, and. And, and you can wave it around a little bit because it is hard for me to, 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 to see. Yeah, I got you right there, right up there. Yeah, yeah, back there. Got it, man. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I see you, sir. Yeah, yeah, young little guy right there. How about in the, how about in the middle here? Anybody? Anybody over here? Yeah, I see you, ma'am. Great. Yeah, right back there. I got you. I got you way back there. How about, yeah, yeah, I see a bunch of hands, kind of shadows up there. All right, everybody just look up here real, real quick, Okay. just want you to know that these people here, the, the reason why we put all this juice into this isn't so believers can come and have a goose bump and sing great music, though, though there's nothing wrong with that. I like hearing good music. I've been encouraged at all the gatherings. My life has been enriched because of this great music, and I appreciate it. But we don't do it for that, only. We do it for that moment where the Lord is doing something in your life. And I don't know if it's a genuine decision or not. I don't, I don't know, I don't get into that. I know time will kind of tease that out. But I do know there were a number of hands that went up. And I'd like to rejoice with you, like with these cards from our last hour. And if you would just put a, a box up in the corner, those will be given to me. And I'll take them home, and I'll take them with me next week, and I'll just be rejoicing and praying for you and the decision you made. Okay, I'm not going to show up at your door or anything like that, but I want to rejoice with you. And then I want to invite you, if you got an email address, I'll, I'll send you an email. If you got snail mail, I'll send you something in snail mail. Just inviting you to the follow class. I, I want you to be a part of that. Eight weeks, and I think it's just a great way to get you on, on a good track. So, so some of you are going to put a star, and those are, that, that's those of you that are believers. And man, you, 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 you want this however much time you got left, you, you want that to be fantastic in light of eternity, right? And then you're gonna put a box up there if you gave your life to Christ and you're gonna walk out of here knowing that my eternity, this life that Jesus came to give me, it's set, it's done. You know where you'll spend the rest of your eternity. And so when you walk out here after this last song, you'll just go to the little, little connect boxes and drop those in there and then they get them and then they give them to me, okay? Why don't you all stand over in the cafe, why don't you stand and, and let me pray and we'll sing uh, this last song together. Lord, thank you for all of these uh, 
folks. I love them. I just love them. I love these worship leaders, our choir and bands, and I love the tech guys and gals and the camera guys and gals and all the guys and gals serving in our children's ministries and all the people who make cookies and all the people who, who love you and it spills over into a love for your church. I love them, I love them, I love them. I'm so thankful for all of them. And I certainly am thankful for those, God, that you worked in their lives here tonight. I look forward to praying for them this next week. And uh, may this song here be a great way to end our time together. And I pray this in your name, amen.